Everyone says to take magnesium and you take it to improve your muscle cramps, you take it to improve your sleep, you generally just take it to improve your health. But what if the science showed that it's engaging in like this chemical civil war inside your gut and you're paying the price for it? and you're also wasting your money. This is happening at a molecular level, okay? There's key minerals that are literally blocking each other from being absorbed. So you're spending a bunch of money on essentially nutrients that are just passing straight through you. We're gonna focus on magnesium and a couple others. And this isn't just a theory. This is a well-documented series of like really competitive interactions. And we need to understand sort of the ancient piece of this as well. So we're not just gonna talk about it. We're gonna break down the cellular mechanisms of these nutrient conflicts. And then we're gonna build out an exact protocol that you can use to stop the conflicts and just get more out of your nutrients. So here's the breakdown of what we're going to cover. First, we'll cover the big one. Okay, we'll talk about magnesium. We're going to look at the data on how calcium intake can actually form insoluble complexes that make magnesium completely unabsorbable. And then we're going to talk about some of the immune minerals. Okay, so we're going to talk about zinc. We're going to talk about copper. I'm going to explain the genetic upregulation that causes like high zinc intake to trap copper. Then we're going to talk about one that drains your energy. Okay, we're going to talk about oxygen. We're going to talk about polyphenols and iron. We're going to look at how compounds in coffee can actually bind to certain minerals and make them useless. Okay? And then finally, we're going to look at the solution. Okay, we're going to look at clear, actionable timing protocol. So we're going to look at the straight up science back schedule so that you know when to take what. So let's get into the mechanisms and we're going to start with the biggest offender. Okay, this is the one that's likely affecting your sleep and probably affecting your muscle recovery every single night. All right, the first one is calcium versus magnesium. I've talked about it before, but this is a really big one we need to address. The evidence here is strong, like really strong. And there was a big study published in the journal Nutrition that took a look at this. The issue is really twofold, okay? It's competition for transport and competition for a direct chemical interaction. That's important. At a cellular level, mechanistically, both calcium and magnesium are cations that are divalent. They have similar charge and similar size. So they compete for entry into your actual intestinal cells. So they share the same, what is called a protein channel. And if you're interested, it's the TRPV6 channel. So think of this as a one lane road into your body. All right. When you flood that road with just a bunch of calcium, calcium is like a traffic jam of one type of car. And it leaves no room for magnesium to actually get through. So the high concentration of calcium simply wins the competition. It's like there's so many Teslas on the road, the Prius can't actually get through or something, right? But here's the more actual direct mechanism, okay? It's solubility. In the alkaline environment of your small intestine, especially in the lower part of it, calcium concentrations and phosphate can precipitate with magnesium. So they form these weird little globs of like insoluble magnesium, calcium, phosphate glob, okay? Your intestinal lining cannot absorb a solid rock. Okay, it needs to be fine, it needs to be small. So the magnesium that you took for sleep and muscle function is literally flushed out. Now, later in this video, we'll give the practical playbook on all of this, like how to time it, how to do things, because I'm not gonna leave you hanging, but we need to cover the bases here. So now that we've talked about the calcium magnesium conflict, what if I told you that the mineral that you're taking for your immune system is bouncing all these other critical minerals out? Okay, we have to address this one. This is a big one and a lot of people make this mistake. So it's the immune system standoff between zinc and copper. Now, not a lot of people take copper, but a lot of people will mega dose zinc and they don't realize that they're actually overloading and inducing a copper deficiency. So the pain is actually real. You're taking 50, 100 milligrams of zinc for immunity, but you're feeling chronically fatigued and you're ultimately getting sick. The mechanism behind this is super fascinating. So high levels of zinc in the intestine, really in the body in general, but especially in the intestine, this triggers an upregulation of a particular gene, okay? And this gene produces a protein that's called metallothionine. Now think of metallothionine as, again, it's like a bouncer at a nightclub that's inside your intestinal cells, in your walls, right? So when you take a lot of zinc, you're telling your body to hire a ton of these bouncers. The problem is these bouncers have a very high affinity for copper. They're like, prejudice bouncers, okay? So they grab onto any dietary copper that enters the body or enters the cell and they refuse to let it leave. They bind to it and it just, it won't leave and get into the bloodstream. So the copper gets trapped and it's eventually flushed out when the intestinal cell is naturally shed. So you're just losing copper. You've effectively created literally a copper blockade. So getting your zinc and copper ratio is super important. And the bottom line is like really just take zinc away from food. 
Okay, and that's really gonna make a big difference. We'll get into a little bit more specifics with it, but just, just take zinc separate. Too much food has copper in it already. If you're taking a multivitamin, it has copper in it. You don't wanna have zinc with it. So just take your zinc separate in almost a fasted state. But even if you nail this, we have to learn about something with your morning coffee because your morning coffee is actually putting like chemical handcuffs on one of the most important minerals for oxygen transport in your body. Okay, so let's talk about iron for a second. Iron in your coffee. Right? And I don't always recommend that people take iron. Okay, I feel like iron is overrated as a supplement, but if you are someone that's taking an iron supplement, this is super critical. Okay, the polyphenols that are in coffee, okay, like the tannic acid, the chlorogenic acid, the really good things in coffee, these are powerful chelators, and it primarily affects non-heme iron. Okay, this is the iron that we get usually in a supplement but not from meat. The mechanism is literally a direct binding action. The polyphenols that are in coffee are like molecular handcuffs, okay? The polyphenols actually bind to the iron in your gut and they create a new like iron polyphenol complex that is too big and essentially inert and cannot pass through the iron transporters in the gut wall. This can actually have a lot of other things attached to it as well. So it can be a massive chelator once iron's attached. Okay, and the data on this is super clear. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a bunch of research showing that a cup of coffee with a meal can inhibit iron absorption by up to 40%, and for tea, it can be over 60%. So much of this has to do with the gut in the first place. You can see where we're going with this. We have to be able to have a gut that can absorb nutrients and minerals. And nutrient absorption isn't just about the mechanical aspect of the gut. It is about the environment of the gut. I put a link down below for the probiotic that I recommend that can absolutely help you with key nutrient absorption. If we have the right biome, if we have the right environment and ecosystem, everything works better. And we don't allow these large particles into the bloodstream through our gut that we should not allow. The last thing you want is large particles to get into the bloodstream. That's an inflammatory nightmare. So the link that I put down below is for my favorite probiotic called Seed. It is a symbiotic. So it has a prebiotic and a probiotic. So a capsule inside of a capsule, really fascinating tech. And it's the only probiotic I'll use because most of them, I quite frankly, are garbage. This is something that you can start taking and start feeling almost immediately. When I started taking it about five years ago, it was a game changer for me. It helped my sleep. It helped my appetite. I had weird cravings before that I didn't realize were being driven probably by my gut bio. Bottom line is give it a shot. I highly recommend it. So now we know a little bit more about how these sort of interactions work, but none of it matters without a clear plan of attack. The next section, what I want to do is I want to give you the single most important part of this video. Okay, this is the actionable timing schedule to make all of this work together. So when you look at the problems at a cellular level, you understand it, but then we need to actually fix it. So this is the schedule that you can use to structure your supplement intake. Let's start with upon waking on an empty stomach. This is when you want to consider taking your iron supplements, okay, if you're taking them at all. I also recommend that maybe you take a deeper look into your anemia and see if it really is something you need to add more iron to, okay? Sometimes it's more about actually just taking omega-3s, taking these other things that allow for the proper. Bottom line is I have other videos on that. So iron absorbs best in an acidic environment. So if you take iron with a little bit of vitamin C, it can increase the uptake a little bit more. And you really need to wait like 30, 60 minutes before having coffee or tea. This is imperative. Okay, this creates a time gap and it allows the iron to actually be absorbed before the polyphenols or handcuffs come in. Now with breakfast, particularly if your breakfast has fat in it, this is the time that you take like the fat soluble vitamins. Okay, so take your vitamin D, take your vitamin E. Okay, they require fat to properly transport and absorb. Okay, so if you take those on the empty stomach, you'll absorb some, but not all that much. Then with lunch, okay, this is when you could take your zinc, but I would recommend taking it like 30 minutes after lunch or really 30 minutes before. You just don't want to take it too much with food that might have copper in it. You can do your research and get more granular about it, but zinc is best like midday on a somewhat empty stomach. Zinc will sometimes make people nauseous, so they want to take it with food. So you could just take it with something that is low copper. Just remember that it, it instigates this copper issue. So you don't want to take it with foods with copper. Now then when we get into the dinner piece, also containing fat, this is when you could add something like vitamin K2, right? If you separate the vitamin K2 from your vitamin E, then you can actually get more absorption. I know we didn't talk about K2 from a mechanism side, but a lot of people take vitamin D and vitamin K. And I know that's fine to take together because you see that, but actually taking them at different times can be even better. So vitamin K2 in the evening and vitamin D in the morning, actually works really well. Just if you do take vitamin E, 
you don't want to take vitamin K with it. Okay. And now the important one, the evening separation of calcium and magnesium. When we looked at that first study, we know that you have to create a time gap. So the optimal strategy for calcium and magnesium is to take the calcium supplement along with dinner. Okay. Take the calcium. It works well with food. It's perfect. Okay. I also personally recommend you get your calcium from real whole food. This is going to be much better. But by separating the magnesium by maybe a couple of hours and taking the magnesium before bed, you prevent that direct competition and you like sort of stop that whole one lane road issue into your body. So you don't have those mineral rocks that form in the gut that don't get absorbed. As a bonus, magnesium is good for sleep. So it's good to take before bed anyway. And in that case, I would recommend maybe a few hundred milligrams of magnesium glycinate. So this whole thing isn't about adding more supplements. It's about being strategic with the ones that you already take. Okay. So if you have this knowledge, you can just get more out of it. Personally, I would prefer you get everything with food. I think it makes way more sense, but why take supplements if you're going to waste them? If you're going to take them, you might as well learn how to use them and get an actual physiological return. Another thing you may want to look at is the world of insulin resistance and supplements that can help with that. So I did a video talking about carnosine. Really interesting. Just a few grams of this stuff has a really profound effect. Metabolic health is obviously one of the most important things. So I linked out to that video right here if you want to check it out. And as always, keep it locked to here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.